to finish this. Uh, <clears throat> I finished this book on Audible, and I would recommend it. It's Jesus Force by Philip Jenkins. Uh, it just goes over the controversies of these councils. There's a lot of the Christology issues. I was listening to um, the Audible, I don't know, to me it's like, what is this, an imperial tradition, right, Byzantium or Christendom or whatever, of this empire, and like how does it, how does it not necessitate violent revolution? I'm trying to find this part that I was listening to. I mean, yeah, when you just look at the issues of Chalcedon and non Chalcedonians, right? Like, uh, we got into a disagreement over their dogmas and stuff, and then it's like, uh, it's like different, I don't know, factions. Uh, produce violent schisms, right? Aren't violent schisms like revolution? Like if secession is a form of revolution, right? Wouldn't uh, schisms, right? Like wouldn't schisms in your church be considered violent revolution? No, yeah, because wouldn't wouldn't necessitate violent revolution? Obviously, coercion, right? I guess people feel like they, you violate their consciousness, right? They feel the need to rebel or something. And this is here on the on this part three, a world to lose, right? It's called Severus of Antioch. It says, "No son of Rome." Of I'm sorry, it says. No son of a Roman emperor will sit on the throne of his father so long as the sect of the Chalcedonians bears sway in the world, right? That's Severus of Antioch. And here it gives you like a brief table, table 8-1. It says the shifting religious balance in the Roman Empire from 470 to 650, right? This is like from 470 to 518. So the dominance of monophysite or or a near monophysite imperial regimes. I'm sorry, my back is like hurting on my neck. Uh, this is from 480 to 550, emergence of separate Nestorian church. 510 to 600, emergence of separate monophysite churches. 518 to 630, this is strong imperial enforcement of Chalcedonian order. And 630 to 50 is the collapse of Roman Christian rule over Egypt and Near East. And it goes on to talk about, like, although the imperial regime could never admit the fact that the Christian world was by 600 divided into several great transnational churches, each with its own claims to absolute truth, this was an ugly reality for those who idealized the church as the seamless united body of Christ as long as Roman and Christian rule lasted over Egypt and, and the East, the empire would never find a workable solution to the theological crisis. Two and two, one were, were, uh, the two into one would never go. And it goes on talking about Chalcedon's enemies, right? But, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, what necessitates violent revolution? And that's how you really this unified church, right? It's just here you were like, 600 divided into several. But the Christian world was divided was by 600 divided into several great transnational churches. Because <laughs> I know, like, a lot of the Orthodox and Catholics, they like to, like, say that Protestantism is very divided. But then it's like, it ties into the idea of, well, well, what is the best outcome, right? 
because I'm not here like Andrew Wilson saying these things, like the best outcome for a, a Christian or America, Christian order. Uh, I told you the best outcome for America and Christian order is dissenting parts and enlightenment. Yeah, because you know you don't really have, uh, you know, these violent schisms that bleed out into the state and then they split the, they, they split the state apart, right? All the problems of the church, which is what you, this book was going over. I was, I was listening to the audible and I was, I was trying to recall like some of the things they said. I wish I took notes. I'm pretty bad at taking notes though. But yeah, because I mean like. I don't consider it uh, like a theistic, a theistic nation or something, or that enlightenment is limited to theism or whatever. Like uh, based on the books that I've been reading, like you know this one, was Queen of Liberty. It talks about how Virginia's uh, religious dissenters, you know, they help the religious liberty. But it's still like you say it's a basis. Of principle of a uh, of Christian tradition but uh, not not necessarily the imperial tradition but the dissenting one right and it, it too goes over like the problems like with the Angelicans and then in Virginia right like uh, they had uh, severe charges and penalties for I don't know just just not 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 worshiping as they do or or not having a license right like You sort of see the problem as well. The same as like the imperial Protestant religion of the Angelican, I think. Uh, I think that's the Episcopalian, right? Or or the Church of England, right? trying to find the part where it said it was very similar to like that's what I'm saying there has to be a difference between magisterial and dissenting traditions like that you know, this book I was reading I was reading um, it says like the Church of England was the established church of colonial Virginia and prior to the American Revolution, no British colony was more protective of its established church, uh, no more abusive of its religious dissenters than Virginia. Uh, local Anglican vestries collected taxes to support Anglican clergy and to maintain a parish church and glebe land. Regular attendance at Anglican services was mandatory. While the law was often honored um, in, the, in the breach, uh, dissenters from the religious establishment, mostly Presbyterian and Baptists, uh, yeah, and Baptists uh, frequently found themselves fined for their absence. Anglican clergy had the exclusive right to cons consecrate marriages. The same lay leaders who controlled the colonial church in Virginia were in firm control of the House of Burgesses, and with the coming of the Revolution, the same establishment leaders controlled the new state government. Uh, in 18th century Virginia, the legal and social dominance of the Church of England was unmistakable. All of this changed with the, with the American Revolution, but that change was far from obvious or inevitable. It was uh, inevitable as the war approached. It just goes over the violence down to like dissenting Christians and stuff like that. And, like, you know, whipping and lashing and things like that, persecuting religious minorities. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. It's, like, it's not really based on imperial Christian religion. It's based, based more on the dissenting Protestant religion. So I guess that's just like, like uh, yeah, that's that's all I was trying to say was that, like, what is really the best outcome? Is it really just having an established church going back to this old order, right? Some old order or something? Like, was it more unified? I mean, I just like read from the Jesus Wars, right? Or I was listening to the Bible and showed that you know, like, you know, we weren't this unified church. So when I ask you where is this, like, where is the apostolate, the one holy Catholic apostolic church, right? And you got a lot of people that believe this, and then, like, and you realize, you know, that it just exists in their mind, right? Like, the God-man, as this book kind of go over there, 
the problems with the god man teaching how you cannot figure out how he was god man and yeah, I'm just giving out my thoughts you know I'll just make a video I haven't made a video in a while and I was listening to uh, you know living orthodox and he was on this video uh, why we call it the Otokos right it's like a 13 minute video and I don't know, I just like, he was saying a lot of stuff that was just babbling, like, like, uh, I can't remember what he said, like he, I know he appealed to God being limitless and, and infinite, right, because he's God, he's so powerful or whatever, and, okay, but at the same time, you want to say that that is the reason why he's able to become a man, right? That's why like, I listen to Kelly Powers as well, and he's still making videos on Philippians 2 because he thinks that the kenosis proves that God can become a man. Like, uh, that God did this himself of glory, that somehow this makes him a deglorified man when it doesn't. It just makes him a deglorified God. So he's a deglorified God in unison with human nature. That's all you've proven. And so with the living orthodox, like, he appeals to the same thing, right? Like. Because God is limitless and all powerful that he can choose to become a man, willfully choose to take upon himself human limitations when that's totally improper to the divine to the divine incarnate person, right? Because the word's supposed to be God, and the word was God. And yeah, the word became flesh. And I told you that it cannot possibly mean that the word became a man. It has to remain what it is, right? Divine. And so because you know, like because uh, he also goes on to talk about, right? That orthodoxy goes on to talk about like how that God, God's divinity, the divine person, did not become commingled with his human nature. And so he's, he said that God was limitless and that God could do all things, right? But you also say that God cannot die and suffer in his divinity, right? That God cannot suffer and die in his divinity. So how can he do all things? Because he's limitless. But he cannot die in his divinity. Yeah, because dying and suffering is proper to a man, not to God. Like, he, like, even if I can see to you, like, the God-man, or not the God-son that become a God-man, right? You know, if I were to tell you there was a pre-existing son, or I mean, if I were to concede to you that position that there was a pre-existing son, like, you would still have to prove that that God-son can remain God, can remain the same person, can remain human all at the same time, in the same sense, being the same person. And I don't believe you're able to do that. And you end up with all these heresies like Nestorianism or Apollinarianism or even mortalism, right? Because you'll see how you have no logical proofs for a divine person of human nature to experience and die like a man because he remained God, right? Um, it's also tied into the ignote thing, right? Like appealing to human nature for why he does not know the idea. That's why I say, well, if he's a divine person in human nature, he should know it, right? Because he remained homoousous with the Father, which is why uh, he should know the day of the hour in the, in the exact same way that the Father knows it, which is homoousous. And so that's why it's hard to believe this idea that he, that he pre-existed as a son, right? Like I said, if I were to grant you the idea that he pre-existed as God the Son, who sat and ate with Abraham, came down from heaven as God the Son or something, um, you would still have to prove the incarnation. You'd have to make sense of it. How to become a man, how to remain God. And I told you, you don't really do this. And the easiest way to break such a frame, right, is to understand that to say that he's God and man, like what it really looks like, it looks like this. To be God and man, right, it's like that God suffered and died upon a cross because he's man. He had never suffered and died upon the cross because he's God. That is literally the God-man logic. That is why it makes no sense. And that's why, at least in the Storianism, the same person suffering and dying upon the cross, and yet not suffering and dying upon the cross. That's why it proves that. That's why I told you that he cannot be this God's son. Because if he cannot die, then he cannot save you. And they, they always talk about how that only God can please God, right? I said that's not true. And the Bible says that without faith you cannot please God. And so how can God have faith, right? He's not a man. 
only a man can have faith. And so that's why I said that he must be a man. And a yeah, man is made both Lord and God, right? Like with the kenosis thing, like I said before. A man is made Lord and God. Man bow before this man and call him Lord and God. And so when it says about things, like in the Bible, it says that Christ was crucified or God bled or purchased it with his blood, right? the blood of God or something. <laughs> like it's not really literal. Because we know we're talking about, we're not talking about God himself dying, but we're talking about a man who wears these titles or is the living embodiment of the deity, right? Because he is the temple of the deity, with which the living orthodox, you know, this, this person denies. He thinks that he is a God-man, which I told you is a refute. It's a easy to refute because it's a illogical contradiction. Because in reality, he pre-existed at God the Son and he becomes a man, becomes God-man. So you're putting God into natures. And like the Eucharist, right? When I was listening to this debate um, between this Baptist and this monophysite, right? Um, it's talked about like is like this Baptist asked this monophysite. Uh, I'm sorry, not monophysite, monophysite or a Coptic. They asked him, um, "Is is God his own body? How do you deal with the, contra the contradiction that God being God is and it's not his own body, right? Obviously, God is not his own body. He's not universal human nature." And so when uh, when you partake of the Eucharist, right, Jesus gives like a man, right, Jesus is a man, he gives other men, his apostles, the Eucharist, and you deal with the, yeah, you eat it, and experience divine life, right, create, uh, create, create, created reality, uncreated reality, yeah, which like when they eat of it, and they consume it, but in it is eternal life, right, everlasting life or something like that, divine life, and I said, yeah, men can partake of those two things, human and divine life, created and uncreated life. Now, God, the divine person, cannot partake of two things. He only remains God. You even said it yourself, right? Remain God, uncommingled. And the ignorate, right? Like, he knows the day or the hour because he is the divine person. So in his human nature, in his human nature, he would know it, not from his human nature, right? Like this Catholic apologist was saying. And, yeah, because, well, I mean, the, on the debate with the Eucharist, right? It all ties into, like, how do you view the Eucharist and all that? And I think uh, it was a debate that William Albert was, was hosting between this, this Reformed Baptist and uh, this, this Coptic Christian. Um, uh, but, I, but I understand, like, uh, what Daniel was saying, right, that Coptic, uh, I understand what he was saying, was like the frustration was explaining to Western Christians, uh, explaining to them, you know, um, that it's, not, it's more than symbol, right, it's like a divine life, like you do the bread, right, you taste divine life, it, it's like a, re a reality, right, yeah, I agree with that, you know, I do, um, that it's possible that God allows you to, to experience, you know, the foretaste of what is to come, right, the everlasting life or so, because yeah, I know I have, I have, I know it's uh, my experience, right? Divine joy. And when I try, I try to explain it to people, as I said, oh, this is my testimony video, right? A long time ago. I try to explain it to people, like, and they think I'm just describing human feelings, right? But that's like, no, uh, divine experiences, divine, like, the divine experience is not the same thing as human experiences, right? That you could tell the difference. It was very powerful. Divine joy, right? Like, what is the kingdom of God, right? I'm pretty sure in the Bible they said that peace, love, and joy in the Holy Spirit, right? And we know that Jesus is born of the Holy Spirit. Um, this kind of, it's a quality of being, right? That's why you have a man, one nature begotten, uh, both God and man, right? But it's a man, one nature of divine quality, uh, born of that, right? So it's like, he's still a man. So he's not a God, man. This is why this person suffers and dies, and yet, he can have the form of God, and I say that, I say that, I associate that with sonship because, I don't know, I feel like Adam was son of God, he was head of everyone, and God makes men, Lord and God, right, like I said, and then other men um, bow before him and call him Lord and God, and so, yeah, a man can have that, that position, that form of Lord and God, and have a, have a position of authority, have a... Um, or choose to take on the form of another man, which is like a, a humble man, right? And yet remain what he is as a man, because in that verse in Philippians, it talks about how he suffered and died, right, upon the cross. And we know that God cannot literally suffer and die upon the cross, right? 
That's why I said that it, it makes no sense when you try to make this person God. That he can never cease to be God and he takes on the form of a man while remaining God. God is a person as God, right? Divine person. And he has this there. He takes on the form of a man while being a divine person. But even though you never prove that God in his incarnation became a humble man or a deglorified man, like you only prove that he became a deglorified God, right? In unison with human nature. And so that's why uh, when uh, I was listening to that debate, right, uh, on the Eucharist, because uh, it, it was brought up, like, did God, like, die or, you know, the separation of soul and body or whatever. And it's like, uh, I would agree to turn in, like, I think they both became historians, right? Because Daniel had to explain, like, yeah, yeah, everyone agrees that God cannot actually die, but his human nature died, like that Baptist said. He said that human nature died, but not God himself, right? Because God cannot die in his divinity, Right? But then it's like, uh, that's what I'm saying. That's what causes the historianism. Because you split the divine person from this human nature, creating two different subjects. And I told you, like, I told you repeatedly, like, what's the sense of the Hades? The divine person present in his human soul, because you don't want to be an Apollinarian. You don't want to say the divine person is his own human soul, right? But you keep saying that, that that's God's logos in Hades, witnessing to those in Hades, right? And so you don't want to say that. So you'll say that the divine person is present in his human soul, right? And so that would be a story and still because you can't say that the divine person is his own human soul. Which is why I said that God never became universal human nature in his unison with man, right? And so that's why it's like when uh, when, you, when you call Mary Theotokos, right? Uh, what exactly did she, did she uh, beget that was of God, right? And you say God's human nature. I say, okay, well, God is not his own human nature. I said that God remained, God remained um, God in unison with human nature, right? This is why, like ties into the ignorate, where God can be said to know in his human nature at any hour, even though the Bible says that he does not, right? It says specifically that, that the Father is the only one that knows, and so you have to be the Father to know the day of the hour. And I listen to all these, like, different apologists, like, like, faith unaltered. Like, he recently, uh, I saw one of his recent videos, and he was, um, arguing with Shibir Ali, right? And yeah, that Muslim was not falling for any of the things that he was saying, right? That was all the typical arguments that they were trying to use. And, like, you know, he doesn't know their hour. And, and but the, the thing is, it's like, okay, but if you're going to say that, that Jesus knows, right? If you're going to say that, uh, to not know, you know, if you're going to say, and if you're going to invert it, the statement like a demon or a devil or you're going to just say that to not know means to know right so it doesn't really mean that it doesn't know it just it means he knows a different way right even though the bible says he does not know and so that's just kind of the problem with uh, magisterial authority right like that's why i made that video right? yeah because you also have to deal with the angels who don't know they're also said to not know, and so you have to say, if the sun knows, and so the angels, because to not know means to know, right? And so that's why I'm saying when it comes down to homoousius and the ignoite, right? Now, the, I think this, oh, I forgot which pope it was. I think it was Pope Vigilus. I think I read even St. Maximus the Confessor agrees that, that you should not use the human nature to explain why Jesus does not know the day of the hour. Right, he's supposed to be homoousis with God, and so if he knows the three human progress or something, and fused knowledge, then it just means he's not homoousis. You know what I mean? Like he would know it in the same way that the Father knows it, which is to go on missions. Which is why it never made any sense when I listened to Chris Wagner talk about the the ignoite. Like at first I didn't know what it was until like Jake the Muslim metaphysician brought it up or so in his video. But I just wanted to know what uh, what what this Catholic was going to say. Because I told him, because I made a, like a brief response video to Lofton. Uh, he was appealing to Athanasius and these other saints. They were saying these things, and I told him that you know it's Nestorian, that what Athanasius was saying was Nestorian. Because he said, in his human nature, it's proper for him to not know. That's going to man. And notice he's speaking of the divine person, right? And I said, oh, the divine person is homoousius, like, like he was saying, right? He was homoousius even in his human nature, and in, in his human nature, he would know it in the same way that the Father knows it. That way, if you say that he does that he knows it another way, which is to infuse knowledge that is to, it's similar to saying he is similar to God, but not in the same sense as God, right? Because God doesn't know it any other way other than the omniscience according to you, 
And so that's why I said, like, uh, so I was just thinking, like, you know, this, like, like God through this Pope uh, have condemned, uh, ironically, Antonius' own way of thinking, right? Or Antonius is condemned by his own way of thinking of homosis, right? Like, that, that's what it means to be homosis with God, right? That he knows it in the same way that the Father knows it. I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling a little. And I just wanted to share my thoughts on those things. And, yeah, so the Jesus Wars is a nice little short book. And I was reading a little bit from the theological origins of liberalism. Like, I wasn't sure how to start the video, so I just started reading. I don't know, something like that, I'm like that, like, I don't know, maybe I could look up some videos on how to plan videos or whatever. Right here, I'm the also... I'm going to read a little bit from this one, right? It's called Doctrine and Power. I, I read from this one a little bit a while back, and just kind of showing, like, how this old violence of antiquity, that I don't consider it, like, something that you should be... Like, I don't think America should be this kind of Christian nation, right? Like, you should want to learn from your past and not repeat it. It says here is the call rapine and death filled church and city in quote. It talks about the routinization of violence. It just says, let us return now to local communities to see how these developments drove church leaders to assert themselves even more aggressively. First Alexandria in late winter 339, in the wake of the Senate of Antioch, uh, Philagoras quote published a decree in quote, announcing that quote Gregory was coming from the um, what does it say? Commentatus, in quote, uh, to be the new bishop. Gregory was no stranger to Alexandria and his Christian community. He had studied earlier, uh, there earlier, uh, when Antonius himself had received him. Uh, the bishops assembled at Antioch were careful to choose a prelate acquainted, uh, acquainted with the city, its clergy, and congregation. The Aryan Christians cheered the news, especially the poor, widows, and virgins whom Antonius had deprived of grain after his return. But the decree left the Antonius uh, seething, quote, they uh, cried out for help, shouting ferociously to the other magistrates and the entire city, end quote, that the new bishop was co uh, coming solely for the sake of the, quote, Aryan heretics, end quote. Uh, Antonius noted this ingenuously, uh, given his return from exile by imperial fiat, that the imperial uh, appointment of a bishop had no precedent, precedent in the church. In fact, what was uh, really under unprecedented was the manner in which the dispute came to intrude into the life of the city. First, a public decree announced the coming of a new bishop. Next, the faithful threatened to draw the, quote, magistrates and the entire city, in quote, into, a, uh, into the fray. Uh, then more conflict and more violence. Um, Antonisha tells us that immediately that Legarus decreed the, quote, faithful began to assemble even more frequently in the churches, end quote. It was Lent, a season for fasting, purification, and incessant vigils uh, when Christians often spent nights in church, uh, spent nights in church singing, hymning, and praying. At the time of, uh, of the heightened devotion, it did not take much to mobilize the, and fire up the faithful. In the weeks preceding Gregory's arrival, uh, Athanasius had received out of his supporters and urged them, I uh, reached out to his supporters and urged them to uh, urge them to resist the new bishop in opposition to the emperor's decree. Uh, monks and virgins responded uh, enthusiastically to, the, to to his calls, and the church crowd swelled even more as the Antonian clergy doled out alms, oil, and wine to the poor. As the day of Gregory's arrival approached, quote, enraged by these events and the novelty of the appointments, end quote, the faithful, sorry, my dog, end quote, gathered to prevent Arian and piety from mixing with the faith of the church. 
and called as of the Antinatian clergy then shut the churches to the Arian churches, a provocative move that Pelagoras could not tolerate. And So the parade the prefect pressure to prepare the church for a great revival decided to strike and arrest Antonius with the help of Duke Relatius uh, during a night vigil at the church of Dionas on March 18th. Relatius, um, I'm sorry, Relatius uh, deployed his troops inside the city and quote, posted his soldiers in order of battle on every side of the church and quote. But Antonius somehow invaded them, fled and disappeared on the underground, and from there he continued to lead the resistance to the prefect, guiding his supporters in coordinating their actions. Philagoras now tried to take the church building by force. According to Antonius, uh, he gathered a mob of pagans, Jews, and troublemakers, armed them with swords and clubs, and unleashed them against the, the faithful crowding of the churches uh, in the church of Dionas. Um, his goons seized the virgins, stripped them naked, and raped a few of them. End quote. Some virgins and widows were dragged about and quote, uh, forced to blaspheme and deny the Lord. Uh, those who refused, they trampled underfoot and beat. End quote. They also thrashed and beat the monks, killing some of them. Clerics and laymen were arrested, beaten, thrown in jail, and banished. At the end of the raid, Philagoras' men offered sacrifices to the gods in the building, uh, bathed naked in the baptistry and set the church and the baby street on fire. Antonius called these atrocities unprecedented. Uh, indeed, the religious riots of the previous generation did not match brutality on the scale, though had we had a, although had we had a fuller account of the events surrounding Athanasius or Marcellus's return in 237, we might perhaps find much that was comparable. He just goes on to talk about more violence. And so I don't know what, uh, what would necessitate systematic violence, like violent schisms or something like that, right? Because you sort of do see that in the Mimic Colonial America. That's why I say it's the religious consciousness or something, right? The problem with uh, your thinking. That's why I said that Enlightenment and Reformation is certainly needed. And I was watching the Nick Fuentes, right? And yeah, he was saying some very anti-Protestant things, like he was saying how uh, Protestantism was the blame for wokeism and enlightenment and liberalism, and, but at the same time, the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, right, or imperial religion, religion of empire, right? It's also why you need reformation and enlightenment, right? Like, I think it's just, like in America, it should be, its proper frame is dissenting Protestantism, not theism, so, like, wokeism, right, they have uh, overlapping language or something, but the presuppositions are different. And so I don't believe America operates on theistic presuppositions at all. I think Jefferson himself wanted uh, America to be a Unitarian Christian nation because he wanted the belief of the one God and the true teachings of Jesus, which is basically, uh, so, you know, biblical uh, Unitarianism, basically, is a form of Christian faith. And Jefferson even saw himself as a Christian. And... Uh, the best way to explain him as a Christian would be as a dissenting Christian, right? Because even though he had radical beliefs, like I don't agree with everything he says, right? But he considers himself a Christian people and heretics consider themselves Christian people. And yet, uh, that's why I said to best explain his radical beliefs would be what was common among dissenting Christians, right? Because they don't have any, like, creed or something, which can be good or bad. But at the same time, it is still a biblical consciousness. And uh, so, because the old way of thinking is full of violence, and it's all, obviously not the answer to this country's problems, right? And so, yeah, so I was, I was remembering, like, uh, I forgot what video it was, but I know, I know it's like one of the recent ones, because this one part I listened to is, was responding to it. So, that's what I'm saying, like, you know, it all ties into, like, you know, what is Christian? How America is Christian nation, right? And, yeah, like when I was raising, I was raising with God for like, what, a few years or so? I don't know how long it's been. You have to answer that question. I believe God has given me this answer. And that's why I made that video, How America is a Christian Nation. I give you these, like, books, right? And I don't know, like, also, like, I remember I had this, like, dream, you know, like, um, 
I have it like you know, a dream. It was like a couple years ago. Yeah, it was. It was um. It was um. Why is he making noises? Um. What was it? Okay. How did I start? It was like. I think I saw this like big tree, right? Like it was a big tree. And it was a very massive tree. And I was looking up and I, I see this like branch, right? This big branch. It was like another tree had grown out of this big tree, right? And I was up there and I was way up there and I could see how it was in the clouds, right? So it's just up there at like I guess heavens or something. Uh, I feel like it had to come down because it was causing a lot of problems and a lot of noises. And then, um, yeah, it was up there. And then I felt like it had to come down. So I um, somehow I got up there, right? Like, I would think, I would like to think it was, like, more of the assistance of God. Because I think it represents, like, you know, the human and uh, assistance. Yeah, like, when I was up there, right, I got up there somehow. And, yeah, I believe it was, like, you know, God's, like, the divine assistance of God upon the human intellect. Uh... I don't know to be uh, able to to reach up there, right? And I was remember I remember I remember thinking that um, yeah, that it'll take it'll take forever for the street to come down or to like the branch. I mean, it was gonna take forever to to, to cut it down. So I remember thinking that, and as soon as I touched it, it came right off, right? It was right right away, and it came crashing down, and so I went back down, right? And and uh, actually, the branch was there on the ground, right? it's like dead. And, and I, I like I could see um, all of these like poison, like like I don't know, poisonous things are coming out of it, right? Like a bunch of like these large insects. And then uh, I could see like yeah, a bunch of like these big old spiders just coming down all around us, right? And I mean, I wasn't afraid. I was just like, man, just another problem to take care of, right? I guess you got to take care of this problem, and then, yeah, and then, then like it switched, right? It switched, and and I was like, yeah, and it's like, you know, my my heart was broken, right? And this, because it switched, and then I I was like seeing, like this woman, right? And she was dying, and she had. She had me wounded on her side, and I was holding her hand, and she was dying, and I was looking right at her, and it was my mom, right, my own mom, and I didn't know what happened, I didn't know why, what was happening, and I was holding, I was holding her hand tight, and, right, and then finally, like, I saw that she was wounded on her side, and she was bleeding, and then I, she, like, finally died, right, and... Like when she died, right? She died on this uh, altar. On this altar, right? It was like where you uh, cremate people, right? And you burn down their body after they die or something. That's what it looked like. Like a wooden altar, like like that. When she died, I just, you know... I mean, my heart was full of sadness, but it was like, I don't know, that sadness wasn't weighing on me as much as it should have, right? Because I, I could tell my mind was in a state of mind. Like, where it's like... Yeah, because I woke up in the same state of mind, right? And so I just sat her hand down gently, and I just went around and left. But I left with, uh, I guess they were co-workers, right? It's like a white truck. And we, we went to go, I guess, determined to go do something, right? I guess like that. Uh, and then that's, that's how, like, basically, I guess that's, that's how I can remember. Like, that's how it ended, right? So yeah, and I, I woke up and uh, like I was saying, I was in the same the same state of mind, like I was kind of working, right? 
and I woke up and I was just in that state of mind where I was like, yeah, just thinking about what is Christian, what is America, how is America a Christian nation, and I keep seeing you bring up these dogmas, right, about the God, man, the Trinity, all of these things, is what they mean to be Christian, I said, you know, these things are probably false, and you keep promoting them like everyone has to accept them even though it's false, right? And I said, well, I don't think that America has to be defined that way if those teachings are false, and so... And in fact, I think that America stands on her own as her own Christian nation, not burdened by the old, the old violence of antiquity, right? Which is the whole point of why you have all these things, right? And so that that's that's where like I don't know, I would like to think that's what that represented, right? In the in the Bible or whatever, Christian theology, like the church, the church is a woman, right? It would be a mother or something. Yeah, but the Lord says like you can't. Anyone who loves their own mother more than me is not worthy of me, right? It's not because he's teaching you a principle of how to hate your mother. It's just that, you know, these things become corrupted. And you cannot love them more than God. And so, that's why I said, like, even though it pains me, right? It's like, but, but it's like you can't, can't love, love that more than God, right? So, uh, yeah, because those things are corruptible. They become corrupted. And Sorry, I'm just tired. So. And so that's how I wanted to share that, you know. I had other dreams, but I don't know, maybe I'll share those later or something. Um, but yeah, anyway, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen.